Welcome to Soulful Living. I'm Philip Montrose with my wonderful wife and partner, Jane. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Show. We have a great show today with a very special guest, Lizette Gilday, and benefiting from the joy of giving. And first, a quick overview for us. We're three day, decades into the field of holistic coaching and healing. We're published authors, trainers, coaches, directors of IAHP, the International Association of Holistic Practitioners. And that's part of Awakenings Institute, a nonprofit organization dedicated to creating a more loving world where the unique gifts of each person are honored and nurtured. So this is timely for Lizette to be with us today, uh, who is a wonderful example of, of giving and love and nurturing and what the show is all about, Soulful Living. And today, as I said, the tip she's going to be sharing is the benefiting from the joy of giving. And uh, we recommend, if you like this, to share the show on other platforms and to other people you know. And uh, we welcome Lizette. Jane? Yes, yes. I'm so pleased to introduce Lizette as our special guest today. And so we can get also a very firsthand perspective on the benefits of and the joy of giving. Um, Lizette is the founder of the Visionary Women's Center, a nonprofit organization located in Western Kenya that helps African women and young girls to survive and thrive in their families and communities. The center provides tools needed to begin to rise above the poverty and trauma that is a daily reality for so many women and girls in Kenya. Lizette travels to Kenya regularly to oversee the operations of the Visionary Women's Center. In her work, she also draws on three decades of experience as a guidance counselor, along with a number of years as a psychotherapist in Montreal, which is where she's from. And I think she will share how she draws on all those skills in her wonderful work too, because it's so interesting how we, you know, we might start in one place and end up in a completely different place, but it all builds on itself. So I think that's beautiful. Uh, more recently from, Related to us, Lizette also became an ordained minister with Awakenings Institute as part of her mission. I met Lizette actually some years ago now and have been blessed to benefit from the joy of supporting the Visionary Women's Center in a small way. In this season of giving, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share her beautiful heart and mission with you. With that, I want to welcome Lizette, and ask you to please tell us a little more about your background and how you came to establish and run a women's center in Kenya. <laughs> Not something many people would think about doing. <laughs> it's true. Hello, so welcome. Everybody. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And uh, thank you very much to Philip and Jane for having, having me on at this Christmas time. Um, when I started my counseling career, I worked at a large women's center in Montreal. And I was so impressed with what magic happens when women support other women in, in moving forward with their lives in all the different aspects of their, their challenges and their issues. Right. So that was something that, that very much impressed me at that time. I then went on to work in adult education as a guidance counselor. And in Montreal, we have a lot of refugees and immigrants coming from all over the world. So I, I had the, the privilege of working with many different refugee groups, starting with the Vietnamese boat people and then mm. the, the Tamils and then the Afghans. And, you know, it just um, went on and on. So I, I learned a lot about um, counseling and working with different um, cultural groups. Um, when I retired at 60, I had always wanted to work in the developing countries uh, mm -hmm. when I retired or a developing country. And I assumed it would be Peru because my adopted daughter is from there. And I also had extensively studied energy medicine based on the Peruvian shamanic tradition. So I had been there um, to do that as well. 
but the universe had other plans for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> As it so often does, eh? Right. Yeah. Um, so my adventure in Africa uh, began after I retired and I decided to go and visit an old school friend of mine who had an NGO in Uganda. And she had ended up living in Philadelphia and had become a Quaker. And it turns out that there are a lot of Quakers in East Africa, in hmm. Kenya and Uganda, which is very surprising. But apparently when the British came in and were ruling East Africa, they divvied up the different parts of the, their colonies to the different religious groups. So they said to the Catholics, well, you can have that section and the Protestants <laughs> and the Quakers can have over here. So there's a lot of Quakers in East Africa. Mm -hmm. So the Philadelphia Quakers went over to help an African Quaker in Uganda build a vocational school. And my friend eventually stayed and took over the school and also started a program for AIDS orphans. And while I vis was visiting her, I volunteered to manage the orphans program in terms of acting as the liaison between the children and their sponsors. And I did this for five years during which time I visited Uganda every year. And this was a huge learning experience for me. It allowed me to um, observe firsthand the challenge um, of running a charity in Africa. And there are many. I bet. Um, yes. So I learned a great deal from my friend and I made many useful contacts, uh, including a social worker named Benta from nearby Kenya. Kenya and Uganda are right together there. And while I was working with these orphan children, <clears throat> excuse me, it became so apparent that really we should be working with the mothers and helping yeah. them with family planning and birth control and safe delivery protocol. Um, so I, I had a, a real urge, a real desire to, to do that, to work with the mothers and, and sort of work with the problem at the, at the root, you know? <clears throat> so based on my experience at, at the Montreal Women's Center, I, I got it into my head that um, <clears throat> I would wanted to do something similar in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Africa. Um, now it turned out that this woman I had met through my, my contacts in Uganda by the name of Benta Obonyo was and is a social worker in Kenya. And she and I became quite you know good friends mm -hmm. from afar writing and that kind of thing and and I said to her so 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 do you want to start a women's center in in Kenya and she said sure <laughs> oh, <laughs> of course <laughs> <laughs> so um I didn't have any funding I didn't have any donors wow uh but I'd been involved with donors for five years working with my friend's project and I felt I, know, I knew how to work with donors. Um, and I was willing to put my own money up to get started, even though I'm a single mother and I have a modest pension. Uh, but I also felt very strongly that I wanted to share my modest retirement income with, with women in the world who were more needy. And I, oh, I, just, had, I just had faith that the universe would support me. So I sort of stepped off the cliff <laughs> <laughs> right yeah, yeah and it, it's so interesting people often say to us varieties of people that they never would have thought of doing what we've done and like how did we ever figure this out and everything and, and it was very much like what you're saying it's one thing leads to another it's not like there was this you know master plan or <laughs> even what we were expecting like you said you were expecting it might be Peru and it turned out to be Kenya mm -hmm. and and I, it's so, mm -hmm. I think that that is one of the beautiful, I think, magical, or you could say miraculous parts about life is that we, each of us is guided to our own unique 
destiny yeah. in a way you could yeah. say and yeah. our sure. possibilities yeah. at least you know <laughs> not that it's preordained or required mm-hmm. but I think that's so beautiful and mm. and I I think as a <clears throat> as a modest donor to the Visionary Women's Center I wanted to tell a little bit just about my story and Philip might want to add to it too about mm-hmm. about being a donor and and Lizette is going to tell us more about what all that means too mm-hmm. to them Mm -hmm. Um, I think Philip and I, we met in a a spiritual organization and it was one of those, this was way back in the 1970s, um, was one of those organizations that you could give and give and give, meaning like large percentages of your income, not modest (laughs) donations. And they always wanted more. And when we left there, I think I felt burned by that. Like I was very <laughs> reluctant mm-hmm. to volunteer to give. Mm-hmm. And then I realized at a certain point, and this was many years ago still, uh, that it was not, that was not right. Because part of that was that I felt like I couldn't make a difference. Mm. And I think, and, and I think, again, Lizette is going to tell us more about mm-hmm. what even $5 a month can mean to someone in Africa. Um, when I realized that what I did, the little things I could do were my vote for the world that I want to create. That really made a difference. Mm -hmm. And then when I I actually got to a point where I thought, well, you know, I want not to be holding on so tightly to money. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I, so it was Christmas time. And I thought, well, at that time we were living in a city and we spent, we very often went past the Salvation Army those really mm-hmm. sweet people with the buckets and mm-hmm. I, and I decided well every time I see one I'm going to put a dollar in the bucket so I started doing that and they were so kind and so sweet and so grateful I it just made me feel really really good and I got I started feeling so good I thought well now I'm going to give them five dollars every time <laughs> I go by and of course you know the ability whatever a person has the ability to do mm-hmm. is is different but i just think the reason we wanted to talk about benefiting from the joy of giving is because it is pure joy when you realize that that you're doing something even if it seems like a little to you five dollars a month or ten or i think you have different categories up to thirty dollars or something and i'm sure you would take more if someone could do that whatever is possible for a person i think that's just a beautiful thing to do Absolutely, it is. And in my situation, um, <clears throat> I, I, my access to, to funders and to donors is somewhat limited. I have some very good funders now who are supporting us every year, but I still have to put quite a lot of my own money in every month. And <clears throat> what I'm finding is that if I can get more small donors um, over the next few years, it will help me, excuse me, <clears throat> to reduce the amount of my own income that I need to put in. And, um, and I have friends who give $5 a month. Right, right. $10 a month. Yeah. So and what would $5 a month mean to a woman in Africa who maybe could do something with that? She, it would mean that um, you can buy a mature hen for $5. And we have a very active poultry program, which I will describe later on. And um, you could also buy, um, put it towards the, the fund for your school, for your children's school fees, which are a big issue in, in Sub-Saharan mm. Africa. Or you could, use it to buy medicine for a sick child. <clears throat> These women who, who we work with um, are, are among the two billion that we hear about in the world who live on less than a dollar a day. Wow. So, you know, it, it's a huge, it makes a huge difference to, to these women. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things I really, personally enjoy about being able to participate in a small way with your organization is that 
it's it is small enough that like now we can talk to you and i think that you have in the past you've sent newsletters with mm -hmm. news on specific people and what what people mm -hmm. are doing over there and what happens when you go and of course right now all of that is <laughs> a little different than usual but mm -hmm. but it is <clears throat> it's very tangible it it's is not like giving a little to a big organization and you think well gosh you know this is this huge <laughs> thing which still i think is a good thing we yes. you know we give to save the children and a number of different causes because we feel like there are so many of them that are important and if and you think if everybody just gave a little to all these causes what that would mean yes absolutely and one thing about visionary women's center <clears throat> is that i don't take any money for myself so every single wow dollar that's donated goes directly to the programs wow so and that's, that's probably somewhat unusual at least that must be yeah. yeah well you know it could be there are i think people who do that but mm -hmm. um it's it's definitely um something to consider when you're when you're giving to charities in in the developing worlds mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. well and when you're talking also about things like being able to purchase a hen for somebody, it doesn't mean that they're going to take it home and and chop its head off and eat it. They're going to use <laughs> that to develop yes. a, a poultry program for themselves and it's going to exponentially grow mm -hmm. value for them so that they can have an income. Yes, that's what's happening with our poultry project that we started three years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's remarkable that they can now have eggs to, to eat for protein and um, they can have enough hens that at Christmas or when a special guest comes, they can go out and chop the head off and serve. <laughs> right, they can do that. <laughs> it's pretty off. It's pretty uh, huh, for a Westerner. <laughs> well, running around the yard and the next minute they're serving it to you. So. Right, yeah. <laughs> but well, anyway, that's, that's life close to the ground. Right. And, um, you know, 85% of all sub-Saharan African people live on subsistence farming plots of less than an acre. Wow. Mm -hmm. So the whole um, thrust is with small, you know, grassroots development is to, is to support the level of subsistence farming that can bring bring people to a higher level of of um what does that mean subsistence subsistence farming or farming lot it means that you um you may have a few chickens you may have an avocado tree or you might not um we're, we're one of the things that really shocked me was that None of the, when I walked around the countryside with, with Benta, nobody had kitchen gardens. So um, that's one of the things that we're teaching them to do. And it's really taking off in the community. Subsi I mean, they're very poor, these people. They, they hire fields to plant corn because they don't have enough room on their own acreage to plant corn for the most part, or they might plant a little. Corn is a really big food for, for the Africans. Um, they pound it up and they make posho, it's called, which is kind of like potatoes. And, and then they, they just scrape by, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, if they have enough money to buy some vegetables or, you know, meat is a real treat. So they eat a lot of vegetables and then the cornmeal, mm -hmm. um, which is of concern because they're not getting enough protein. Right. Um, but I mean, people are really thin in Africa. They are not, you know, and the children are very thin. Mm, so yeah. um, I don't know if I answered your question, Philip. It's... Um, sort of it's hard to imagine it's a very i mean literally people won't eat if they don't have food and then they'll go and dig in somebody's field that's the other thing all the farming 
is done, the local farming, like not the big fields that surround them, which are um, big commercial fields, but the, the subsistence less than an acre per plot uh, farmers, they do everything with a hoe, with the old fashioned hoe. And it's mostly the women who do it. So they'll <clears throat> hoe up, um, they'll go and do, do digging, for, it's called digging. They'll go and do digging for someone else mm -hmm. and get paid a few cents. Um, or they'll take, now that our women have um, vegetables, to sell, they go to the local schools when they're when they're getting out at the end of the day, and the mothers come, and they sell the vegetables that they're now growing to make a little money. And one of the things that was so devastating during the COVID um, was that they really they completely shut things down in Kenya, so nobody could go out and do a little digging or sell some vegetables. Wow. Right. You no. Know, so but they had no way to support they had, themselves. No. So hmm, it's day to day. Nobody has a refrigerator. Everybody shops every day. And wow. you just hope that you're going to have enough money to buy some food. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's really amazing when you think. And another thing about that is we don't a lot of times realize how blessed we are in the Western world here in Canada and the United States yeah. and so many other countries. But, you know, we complain about, well, I don't have, you know, my, my big RV or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But these people really point to what it means to, to be yeah, in need. True. Yeah, they really yeah, and do. I, and I know you have other, other programs too. Did you want to describe some of the other things that you do? Yes, I would like to, but I'd like to, first of all, <clears throat> describe a little bit in more detail about our mother's support program because we have built it up now over three years. We now have a hundred mothers and grandmothers who we support, who are supporting 800 family members. Wow. And we have to, to we've, we're using the model of small groups. So we have groups of 15 mothers and grandmothers who form their own group within the community. So that's, they're responsible for their group and for the well being of their group. And the first year, we do what's called table banking. And it's an amazing, it's all over Africa. It's an amazing small group savings program where everybody puts in what they can and it gets held in the group for a year. But every time you come, every week or every two weeks, you have to bring a little something to contribute. So when you cash out at the end of the year, <clears throat> you get more than you put in. Hmm. And you can also um, take small loans if you need it, if you have an emergency during the year. So it's quite a complicated process. And Benta, um, our social worker, is really good at it. She really understands how to set it up and oversee it. You need someone to oversee it. Um, so that is the first year that's required of the mothers and grandmothers. And if they get through that first year successfully, then they qualify for our poultry raising project <clears throat> and our organic gardening project. <clears throat> and the organic gardening project is a very specific project. We took our first group of, of, of mothers groups to um, a place called Monroe House. And it specifically, it was started by Westerners. It's specifically designed to teach the subsistence small farmers how to increase the, the 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 yield of their little farms and with the processes that they teach like particular kind of digging it's called double digging where you dig down very mm -hmm. deeply and turn the soil over and then you mix in your organic um, your organic manure and and compost that they teach you how to do as i said before you can double you can increase the yield of that little plot two to six times, which is huge, you know? Right, yeah. Another thing yeah, that and, or, and then doing it organically too and training exactly. that rather than training something that's not, not that obviously yes. much yeah. more beneficial for yeah. the future. And, and they, then they, they can't afford to buy fertilizer anyway, you know, mm -hmm. and their soil much healthier. 
we also are providing them with with what are they called garden gardening bags and they're they're huge bags um, where you can plant they have little openings out the side and on the top and you plant um, in the bag in the bag wow <laughs> They have a very long dry season in Kenya and the, some of the women who don't have water nearby have to walk, you know, a mile there and back to, to get water. So this way they can use a little bit of water and still have vegetables mm -hmm. during the dry season. Yeah. So, and then we also have a lot of emphasis on family planning and birth control and also we have a special program now for reproductive health. So if we have women who are really having problems, um, we can take them to the gynecologists in the local, the local town, mm. which is so amazing to be able to do that for them, you know? Right. And it's really interesting, like these rural African women really understand the whole issue of family planning and birth control now. Um, you know, I'll be sitting in it literally a mud hut um, <laughs> with these women who are, you know, just fresh from the field, really few, not all of them even know how to read or write, and they really get it. So, and the older ones are saying, don't be like me. I had 11 children. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So also educating one another so that, but we're there and also we, we really emphasize the importance of hospital deliveries because there's a very high mortality rate among mothers delivering in Kenya. It's mm -hmm. shockingly high. So that's something else that we emphasize. So that's very gratifying, you know, to, to teach them those, those skills. And we, we visit them and we go into their, we visit their homes. The, our social worker visits their homes at least once a year so they can you know, have a private discussion with them about what their needs are. And if there's a, a need, um, Benta and our new social worker, Rhoda, will go in and do, you know, couples counseling, family counseling. And it's really been fascinating for me to watch because African men, rural African men, have never heard of couples counseling, let me assure you. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I can imagine. Nor is, it, nor is it something they would be open to, right. but we've seen the impact of Visionary Women's Centers programs on the well-being of their, not just their wives, but their children and them, you know, with all the increase in income and well-being. And so when there's a problem now, they'll call they'll call Benta in for counseling and the men are right in there, right, ready to go. So it's, it's been fascinating to see that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, so those are our main programs for the women. And then we do have, um, we have a school program called Life Skills. It's called our Life Skills in School program. And it, um, it we go into schools and, um, and we work with the girls and the boys and it's order to, in order to try and reach the next generation and teach them positive values around the place of women and girls in modern society. We also do, you know, AIDS prevention and drug education and um, self-management and information and the education system. And it's very, um, they respond really well to this. They really appreciate it. And um, again, it helps them. It, it encourages their self-esteem and their assertiveness, um, especially right. the girls, but also the boys, you know, just to have someone come and talk to them about these things. Right, yeah. And then the other program that we have that works with children and adolescents is, um, it's, an, it's a rape and bullying prevention program. And there's a very high incidence of rape in the community that we live in, both, both for girls and for boys. So there's an amazing program run by a California organization in Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya. 
and it's called No Means No Worldwide. And we've based mm. our, our, um, our workshop, you know, model on their workshop model. And they've started off in the slums of, of Nairobi, which are really heavy duty slums. And now they're trying to have this program all over Kenya, all over Nairobi. So we, we've started, we've got our model going and we're trying, you know, we're starting off small. We're hoping to be able to grow it. Right. And it's a wonderful program. It has, you know, it looks at all the aspects of, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, social, social values, traditional female roles, different types of sexual abuse and bullying, effective communication. We also have a self-management behave, management behavior. We also have a, a wonderful um, African man, Kenyan man, who comes from the local town, the local city, Eldoret. He's a martial arts teacher. And he comes and teaches, teaches the girls and the boys self, like basic self-defense and how to defend themselves. So it's, it's a very, um, it's a wonderful program. And the, the name for the girls is the girl power in me. And <laughs> It's the hero in me. So they're shifting, you know, trying to get boys to see the importance of taking on that kind of a role. And then we have this really hilarious get together at the end where the girls and the boys get together and they tell one another what it's, what they think of the, like, what do the boys think of the girls and what do the girls think of the boys? Mm -hmm. And it's hilarious. But again, you know, they're exchanging and they're learning and so it's a very, very, um, we're very excited about that. That's our newest program. Yeah, yeah, that's um, really incredible, yeah. all the things you can do. And, you know, when people, it is, it is so easy to be in that kind of a place of thinking, well, why bother? It's all too hopeless. You know, I just, it doesn't matter. You can see where just, you know, a, a small amount <laughs> going in makes a big difference in a place like that. And I, and I do think, I don't know if you have statistics on this, Lizette, that poverty, the level of starvation and real poverty is going down. Yes, it is. And it is. So people like us who can just do a little are making a difference. I, it's a very interesting question. And, you know, having spent 10 years now in, in Kenya and Uganda and observing what's going on, there is a huge amount of effort being put in to shift Africa to the next level. And something really interesting that I just started realizing last year, every single person I work with over 30 all my, Benta and all my all her executive committee and all the people I meet, they all come from polygamous families, and they all grew up living in on on the land with at least three families, with the one father who had to go around and get food for all twenty five of them every day. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's it's and and they didn't you know they couldn't read or write or. Um, so it's, you know, Africa has gone in one generation from rural polygamous families to university training, everybody trying to finish school, um, you know, and it's Western based education that they're getting. So it's a huge shift in one generation. Right. And one of the, the things that we talk about, those of us who go over and, and work with the Africans, is that um, one of the things that we're trying to do is educate and uplift enough people that we can start, they can start forming a middle class, because there's never been a middle class. There were the British colonials, and then they only left in the in the 60s or the mm -hmm. 50s. And right. then you had sort of the overclass that the British colonials left. And now you've got this huge number of people who are living as peasants on the land. And they're like Benta and all the people in our executive committee and everyone we work with. 
So it's this huge effort to try and get enough of this generation educated and working in that way. So it's a really interesting challenge, but I think mm -hmm. that's the vision that people who, who are working there have, and it's happening. Right, and that's that's the thing. It's not just a vision, like you you know, one of those things that's like, <laughs> it's this far out kind of idea. Yeah. This is a very practical mm -hmm. idea. And it is, um, it, it is, I've been impressed when I've received your, your newsletters at how joyful and grateful and mm -hmm. just engaged the women seem to be too. Yeah. African women are a force to be reckoned with. Right. And the African grandmothers are something else again. <laughs> they, they will take on two, three, and four orphans because their children have died of AIDS. Or the, like the parents, the, the, the mother's children has died of AIDS or they've left a lot of, um, a lot of women leave their children and go into the city to work. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and that kind of thing so these and and then i know one grandmother who has two or three orphan two or three of her her kin that she's looking after little ones like five six seven two and she took on two orphans from the street wow she brought them home and said they're just sleeping just on the street mom from big Earth. heart huh? <laughs> and, and they don't have enough to eat right and, but they do it anyway and I, I say to the grandmothers, you are so amazing. I mean, the grandmothers in North America sure wouldn't be having four or five kids, you know. Right there. And, and the mothers and grandmothers, they were on Christmas this year. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Right. Well, I said they're on cruises, but not this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, not this year. <laughs> the retired, the retired people off on a cruise somewhere. Yeah, which is fine too. I'm not, I'm not putting that down. But there, mm -hmm. I just am so impressed with what is possible in a situation like this. And yeah, and I think, I think we, Philip, we didn't get a chance to hear from you on the joy of giving, kind of maybe your background and uh, how you well, feel about it. Yeah, I think that I think it's great to look at your life, like where can you give, you know, what can you give? Could be material, could be your time, could be your energy. Right, that too could be yeah. your attention. And it, it's really uh, inspiring someone like Lizette, who's been pretty selfless for her time and energy to devote to other people. She has a calling, something that inside her is calling for her journey, her right. destiny to do that. But, uh, you know, as Jane was saying, everyone sort of has their own ways of doing it. There's a lot of different touch points, a lot of different ways you can give and connect with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just in a general, as a, as a general comment, uh, being able to give a little time too is a good thing. You know, yeah. Philip and I have done that over the years, and I I'm a actually I a, I work with Casa. I'm a, a Casa, <laughs> which is the uh, child child advocates in the United States. And I, do they have Casa in in Canada? It's really a wonderful thing. Do you, do you know about Casa? No. Is that, well, it's a it's an organization. Um, I'm trying to think what it is. It is well, it's child advocates, and they actually are mandated by the court mm -hmm. to advocate for children who are in the uh, social welfare system in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so these are children who may have been taken away from mm -hmm. families where there are, are a lot of drugs or. Um, mm -hmm. mental illness in the family or whatever it is and and they go into the welfare system and then who knows where they go <laughs> they yeah. they end up in a lot of places and and the yeah. judge the judges who have to evaluate their situations mm -hmm. they're working with social workers who have very little time really with each child mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the CASA is our our mandate uh, as a child advocate is to go in and actually spend time it's a little different, obviously, now with COVID too, but to spend time with the child every week and have a good understanding of what's happening with that child. And then we report back to the court. That is excellent. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. And then also for 
older children who may not ever be adopted, then the casa becomes like a, a fairy godmother or fairy godfather, you know, <laughs> another, a, another person or maybe the only person in some cases who's there to support mm -hmm. them and tell them that they're worthwhile and encourage them on. And so, yeah. and the, I just, that's just another example because I hadn't, I kind of forgot about that when mm -hmm. we we're talking about donating, donating time. And it can yes. be just an hour or two yeah. a week for something that is so meaningful to a child. That's huge for a child. You could be their lifeline. Right. Yeah, w one person could make all the difference in a child's life. Right. They've done yeah. studies on that too. If you just have one, even with abusive childhood, if you have one person you can depend on, it can make all the difference how you grow up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and sometimes they'll be moved from one one, oh, one home to another home and the casa is always there and moves with them unless they're taken mm -hmm. out completely out of the area where they can't mm -hmm. but the that, actually the child i'm working with now was moved from one place to another since mm -hmm. i started working with him mm -hmm. and i'm the only one who has been a bridge in, in that to, mm -hmm. who's been able to you know to see that <laughs> and to report on what that's meant to him that is very impressive. I wish we had that in Canada. <clears throat> That's a very California thing. <laughs> well, it's all over the United States, though, I think. All over the United it, States. Yeah, it started wow. quite a few years ago now. And it really makes sense when you think about it. That it I does. think it started with the judges felt that it was very hard in so many cases. They didn't really have enough information to be able to evaluate a case because they're deciding on the next step for the child. Yeah. You know, send them back to the parents, send them here, send them there, you know, <laughs> take parental rights away, keep the parents involved. It's, there are so many different things that have to be considered. And if right. a judge, if, if they only have the evaluation of a social worker who gets to spend an hour, maybe or half an hour a month with the child, how can they really evaluate it? They can't. They can't. Right. That's really remarkable. Very impressive. Right. So there are there are things in in that way too, but I just I think I have I really appreciated working with the Visionary Women's Center and of course knowing you and knowing from you exactly all of the things that are happening and how that is making a difference. It does makes me feel good. Well, and I very much have appreciated your support, and I just wanted to touch on the the whole issue of of giving, you know, it is right. <clears throat> and, and that sense of why bother or it's all hopeless. Um, it, it's, it's easy to, to slip into that sense of hopelessness. But I think it's a very sad and bleak place to be. It is right. And in a way, it speaks to our, our worldview and our deepest values to, to understand that that is a very uh, dark place to end up as a human being. Mm -hmm. Right. It makes you feel bad about yourself and everything. <laughs> about everything. Yeah. And, and it, it's just, I am so clearly aware of all the problems and issues and challenges that that Africa is facing and that the people we are working with are facing. In the last year, they've had droughts, floods, locusts, wow. COVID, you know, but they still remain um, resilient and keep putting one foot in front of the other. And if they, you know, can maintain their sense of hopefulness, I think it's a good model for all of us. Mm -hmm. And it makes... It makes, as you're saying, it makes such a difference to get the newsletters and to follow the different people yeah, yeah. happening and to see, you know, and <clears throat> to hear about, I mean, just for me to sit in a, in a hut, a, a mud hut in rural Africa with um, 15, you know, mothers and grandmothers and tell them that they're great and that they are right. amazing and that the grandmothers are famous all over the world for what they do. <laughs> and you see them sort of- They light up. Their yeah. Eyes light up and they're, cause women, those women are treated terribly over there. Mm -hmm. and, and just to have that 
information coming in it's that's really shifting things mm -hmm. and when, when i when i speak to the men they're everyone's very friendly in africa and they come up to you and ask you what you're doing you know if you're a white person <laughs> right <laughs> bring here say well i've started a women's center so they inevitably say well, well what about the men i just starting a set i said you know i think the women need it more than you do <laughs> oh no you know <laughs> And then I say to them, you know, I understand that when there's a meeting, the women all sit on the floor and the men sit in the chairs because mm. that's what happens. And they go, oh, oh, well, that's cultural. You can't, you can't question about us about that. And I say, women all over the world are starting to question you guys about that. It's not cultural. It's, you know, it's not, well, it's okay. not a good culture. <laughs> <Anyhow. Chauvinism. laughs> like, it's not cultural as an experience. All right. So, so that that's like again you know it's like the pebble in the pond it like it goes in and it moves around and it's very interesting that shifting of values and zeitgeist and um yeah it's it's so fun mm -hmm. <laughs> and just in terms of making a sacrifice it it's i get as much as 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 i give you know and and you're saying you get as much as you give and I can remember somebody when they arrived in Africa to work on a project, standing the first morning on the porch, this was over at my friends, my Quaker friend in Uganda. And he looked out and he was so pleased to be there. He's worked in Africa for years, but he'd come back from England to do this project. And he looked out and he said, you know, I don't know who benefits more. <laughs> the Africans, because the white people, Europeans come here or us who come to work with the Africans. So mm, right. It's yeah. like what you get in, in the Costa program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And in our work in general, our our mm -hmm. our mission is to create a more loving world where everybody's every every individual's unique gifts are honored and nurtured. And that means everybody. <laughs> and it yes. is interesting when Philip and I, of course, we have plenty of opportunities to discuss the polarity that exists in our country, in the United States right now, especially, and mm -hmm. and how there is a spirit, <laughs> I don't know if spirit is even the right word, <laughs> of hatred, you know, and, and of, of, I need, you know, I need to hate these other people so I can get more. And, and it just is so obvious to me that we'll all be, we'll all thrive the most mm -hmm. if we support each other. Mm -hmm. You know, if you help everybody you can to be the best they can be, mm -hmm. can't that be just the best of all possibilities? I mean, I don't know how it could not rather than, well, like you were saying, if you just give up and say, well, you know, it's too hopeless. Like, you know, how can I ever make a difference? It doesn't really matter. Mm. And everybody just sits around, and does nothing. Obviously, it's not going to be as good. No. And plus, I, plus what you were saying about, I think, and it is, to me, the bottom line is our perception of ourselves and to be able to go and spend time with those women mm -hmm. and boost their perception of themselves. That's everything. You know, then they raise their children, their girls to believe in themselves mm -hmm. and they can all, they, they, they'll be able to be more and do more that yeah. way. And they're starting to raise their sons to, you know, to carry the water and carry the sticks. And, you know, those sort of iconic, classic gentlemanly pictures. things. <laughs> well, no, but in Africa, you know, the classic pictures of the silhouette of the woman with the water on her head. Oh, they're carrying the everything. <laughs> I don't find those so romantic anymore now that I've been there. Right. It's only the women who are doing that. You'll see, I saw a little girl of about five with a little bundle of sticks on her head with her mom and dad there. And the, the son was sitting there with nothing on his head. <laughs> but we're working on that, you know? And again, mm -hmm. it, it spreads out and it's like the women are starting to get their boys to, to help more. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. So it's, um, it's, a fa it's a fascinating um, experience to be engaged in social change mm -hmm. at that right. level. And, and especially as a woman to be engaged in, in 
in educating women and girls and the boys and the men um, about the new paradigm that's coming in, you mm-hmm. know? Right. So, yeah, it's, it's all very rewarding and enriching. Yeah. yeah. And you know what the Bible said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And I think I often think about that. And I mm-hmm. think on some levels it's true, you know? Right. Right. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Speaking, speaking of which, <laughs> um, is there anything you wanted to add before we, we wind up here? Or are you ready to share how people can find out more? Certainly, if you have something else you want to add, we'd no, love I, to hear I, it. I think we've, I think we've um, had a very good discussion. And I've appreciated sharing with both of you and hopefully with some of the listeners on um, on what it's like to run a small women's center in rural Kenya. <laughs> right. <laughs> And how oh, that, the first time many of them have heard, <laughs> heard anything about that. Yeah. Well, it's it's happening out there and it's it's fun, you know, mm-hmm. and that's it's wonderful. happening. Yeah. And enriching. So um, as you mentioned, I have a modest donation program that um, people can donate through uh, PayPal mm-hmm. and or they can um send a check but since i live in canada it would probably it's probably better to pay through paypal mm-hmm. yeah Although, that's a, a good thing well, I have, thanks to you been able to set up a a bank with a charity um designation in the states but canada the canadian american border is closed at the moment right so, it's <laughs> so ironic all of the things that are I happening know. so as soon as it opens up I will be over there and then, you know, that will be easier, but I have a website and I don't know if you're able to put the website up. Yeah, or, I can put it up. What, what is it? It's www.womenscenter and center is spelled. Is, isn't it Visionary Women's Center? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Visionary Women's Center. <laughs> Yeah, well, you have to get the whole thing in there, are you? <laughs> Visionary Women's Center, all sort of all run together with no apostrophe after the S or anything for women. Right. And, and it's C E N T R E. C E N T R, because that's the British way of spelling center. And they're still very much doing things the British way. They even drive on the left side of the road over there. Hmm. Yeah, so it's visionarywomenscenter.org. Org. And I'm, I have it open on my other monitor here. And, and there's a beautiful picture of a bunch of wonderful, smiling people there. And Those, you go all the way down to the bottom of the page. You have to go all the way down. Now it's not showing. I don't know what happened here. Oops. Isn't it at the bottom or is it? No, it's at the top. It's oh, at it's the- at the top. Yeah, I don't want to mislead people. No wonder I wasn't. Oh, good. That is a better place. Yeah. And you can donate in US do- dollars or Canadian yes. dollars. So oh, we Canadians love those Yankee dollars. <laughs> right. Yeah, you get actually they get more for their money on that one. Yeah, we do. And yeah, so you can there are options as low as five dollars a month up to 30. And I'm sure if people wanted to go yes. above that, that's certainly yeah, possible. I figured out how to make it more. <laughs> But I have one donor who does a double donation every month to, mm-hmm. to give. Mm-hmm. So whenever yeah. you feel inspired to donate, that would be amazing. And then you'll be on the list to get the newsletter every, every, at least twice a year. And I'm trying to, going to try and get it out more. Wonderful. And I'm going to start sending every two months um, updates little updates for the monthly donors yeah. or the one-time donors all the donors are going to get mm-hmm. right and i've it- gotten those over the years too and which i i really enjoy i read all of that and oh. and it is well it's so heartwarming because you don't you don't realize how much of a difference it can make when you look at all of these wonderful people on your website i mean it just is amazing that you've done that basically from you 
I know. I, I, I find it rather astonishing myself. Right. Yeah, oh my and you God. think, well, I, how much of a difference can one person make? And, and that's yeah. an interesting thing, too. It's like, if you can help one person, you're doubling, you know, you're doubling your <laughs> whatever it is, your ability to make a difference. And look at all those people. And yeah, 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 yeah I think I just think what you're doing is so wonderful. Thank Exponential. you. Exponential. Yeah. It means a lot to me to <clears throat> have your support. Oh, thank you. And well, you I mean, too. like this is just talking about this. It, it is, I think that we've, in this time we've spent together, I feel really blessed to be able to give. Thank you. Mm. Means a lot to me. Oh, thank you. Same Us too. My faithful donor for years <laughs> and years and years. And it, it just, it, it really, cause you know, it, it's just to know that people are out there supporting what you're doing is really important when you're doing this kind of work, you know? Oh yeah. 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 And for us knowing you can make even a small difference, you know, maybe mm -hmm. participate in buying a hand for somebody, <laughs> right. whatever it is. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's um, amazing how little can go such a long way there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks, Lizette. Yeah. That thank you so much. This has thank been a you. wonderful time together. And I wish everyone a happy, safe holiday time. We're totally locked down in Canada. We're not allowed to go anywhere for Christmas. Right. So, we're, we're supposed to be in California too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So let's hope we're, we're able to get out and about soon. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. we count our blessings. Right. Yes. Well, yeah. So mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. thank you. And happy holidays to you. Yeah for being a guest on the Soulful Living Show with your Visionary Women's Center, talking about the benefits of giving exponentially. Mm -hmm. It can occur as we described, as you wonderfully described. And if you did enjoy this show, uh, we hope you join us every week at this time and invite some of your friends and share it because uh, we can make a big difference just by listening to shows like this and following up the soulful strategies and uh, the benefits of giving, for example, this week that Lizette so wonderfully described to us. And for us, Jane and myself, our books and courses and offerings, you can find us at gettingthrough.org, getting T-H-R-U.org slash holistic, gettingthrough.org slash holistic. And we do value your support, tuition for our courses and other purchases for our mission of helping to create a more loving world and supporting people like Lizette. Uh, and if you can share this message of love with those around you, we can change the world. Have a wonderful week. Thanks again, Lizette. Yeah, thank you, Lizette. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.